Jeffrey Eugene Bell, a doctoral candidate in the School of Music and the College of Fine Arts, will now sing the national anthem. It is now my privilege to present to you the president of Ball State University, Dr. John Worthen. Honored guests, trustees, members of the faculty and administration, graduates, parents, and friends, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this 110th commencement of Ball State University. This is a most happy day for all of us, and we are glad that you are here to share in this significant occasion. It's a very special time for you who are graduating and for your families and friends, and we offer our warmest congratulations. I'm pleased now to introduce the Board of Trustees. Would you please hold your trustees are James W. Parks, President, Frank A. Bracken, Vice President, Tom Storm Party are Dr. Warren Vanderhill, Dr. Richard C. McKee, Executive Assistant to the President, Dr. John J. Proust, former President, and assisting with the ceremony today will be Dr. David and an emeritus of public service is carrying the mace, the university mace today. Dr. William Edson, Associate Dean, Dr. William Kennedy's, Dr. Donald Van Meter, Associate Dean, Dr. Re Rebecca Pierce, Assistant Professor of Mathematics, privileged to recognize the most honored guests here today, the graduates and the families of the spring class of 1994. Welcome and congratulations again. It's been uh, four long years uh, for, for some of you uh, five or perhaps even six. Scrimping and saving, struggling and sacrificing for this. You have persevered. You have completed your academic program. And today you join the company of scholars. This ceremony marks an important occasion for the university as well, because it signifies that we have fulfilled our responsibility to you. We haven't taught you everything you will need to know in your lifetime. No one could uh, ever hope to do that. But we have taught you how to learn. And we are absolutely certain that that is the most important tool you will need to survive and prosper in the 21st century. Already, you occupy a special place in Ball State's history. Yours is the 75th anniversary graduating class. And with this ceremony, we conclude a year-long celebration of the university's diamond anniversary. Ball State has traveled a long road from a tiny school at the end of a trolley line, born in turmoil and dissension, chartered to train school teachers up to the fifth grade, staffed reluctantly from faculty from another institution without even name, a name of its own. We have arrived here today in large measure because of the will, wisdom, and wealth of five brothers and their descendants. From the very beginning, the Ball brothers understood the contributions that a college would make and the value it would add to their community. That foresight led them to purchase the 64 acres and two buildings of a failed private college and donate them to the people of Indiana to establish a state school here. We've always desired to be the kind of university that Samuel Johnson described when he said, the supreme end of education is expert discernment in all things, the power to tell the good from the bad, the genuine from the counterfeit, and to prefer the good and the genuine. With grateful appreciation to all who've come before us, I believe Ball State is that kind of university, and the story of our first 75 years has been worth celebrating. As an educated person, you must be careful to think first and act or react second. You must be critical of what you hear, skeptical of what you see, 
prepared to analyze and evaluate and draw valid conclusion, conclusions from conflicting information. You must not believe everything you hear or follow everyone who claims to have the answers. You must be prepared to discover the answers for yourself. Now more than ever, our nation, our state, our communities, our businesses, our school boards, our city councils need careful, rational, thoughtful people. You are ready. We have taught you how to learn. Now go and do. You may not be responsible for the way the world is today, but you must be responsible for what it becomes tomorrow. You have completed something very important with this ceremony today. Keep the enthusiasm that you feel in your heart this morning, and in the future, when they ask you where it came from, you may answer proudly, I found it at Ball State University. Thank you and congratulations. May we now proceed with the conferral of the honorary degrees. I ask Mr. Parks, Mr. Bracken, Dr. Vanderhill, Dr. Wheeler, and Dr. Wright to come forward to assist. Mr. James Burke, will you please present yourself for the awarding of this degree? Mr. President, I am pleased to present James Burke for the degree Doctor of Humanities Honoris Causa. As Great Britain's foremost commentator on science and technology, James Burke has created a substantial body of unique television programming that is accessible, provocative, and informative. The path that led Burke to his current role as bridge between television audiences and the scientific and technological explosion that surrounds them is full of the kinds of connections that Burke delights in making. With an MA degree in English literature from Jesus College, Oxford, Burke acquired the background for linking the sciences and the humanities. In 1979, he explored the evolution of technology in the prize-winning 10-part series Connections, which achieved the largest documentary audience ever in the United States. It has now been broadcast to more than 50 countries and is on the curriculum of 300 colleges and universities in North America. From Connections, Burke moved on to an examination of the brain and the nature of human perception in a BBC production entitled The Real Thing. His next project, The Day the Universe Changed, completed the trilogy and examined discoveries and innovations that have had a significant effect on society. Burke's newest series, Connections 2, takes a seemingly unrelated series of events, people, and situations. To cite one example, World War II defense radar, French neo-impressionist painters, 16th century Far East traders, and whaling, and fits them like a puzzle, forming a unique set of associations. James Burke has now appeared on our campus three times, twice for our university programs. Just before Mr. Burke's appearance in 1990, a young man approached him and delivered a testimonial about how Burke's Connections series caused him to formulate his life's goals, and as a result, to change his entire career direction. While the extent of such dramatic personal stories may never be known, Burke's vision of the world is truly a demonstration of the power that lies in observation and communication across disciplinary lines. As a humanist, Burke consistently conveys the message that science and technology can ultimately bring good to society. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Ball State University, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Humanities with all the rights and privileges thereunto pertaining and award you this diploma in testimony thereof and present you the academic hood for this degree. President Worthen, Provost, Dean, members of the Board of Trustees, ladies and gentlemen, and most important of all, the spring class of 94. It gives me more pleasure and satisfaction than I can express to be here and receive this degree today. I wanted to start, I will, I will be brief, I wanted to start with something that would try to convey to you the fact that I do understand how you feel today. 
A man falls off the top of a skyscraper, and on his way past the 74th floor, somebody asks him how he's doing, and he shrugs and says, so far, so good. <laughs> With the rest of your life ahead of you, I imagine very much that that's how you're feeling today. I spent some time before I wrote these remarks wondering what I could say that wouldn't bore you, and then I gave up, so I'm going to bore you. <laughs> but only for three minutes and 45 seconds. You people who are graduating today here are going to shape and run the first half of the 21st century, and I think it is going to be a wild ride compared with which an MTV commercial will look like paint drying. Now, I could dress up what follows in pompous phrases and stuff, but I think I'll just give you a menu for some of the things I think you are going to go through, add a couple of comments, and then shut up. I think you are going to see the kind of computing power and speed and capacity that will bring the end of most forms of present-day specialist qualifications so that knowing anything in the sense of being an expert will, in your lifetimes, become an antiquated and obsolete art. I think your equivalent, the graduating class of 2050, will qualify, if they do at all, in access and in imaginative use of the network rather than in becoming anything. The machines will specialize, the graduates will generalize. This is not just a wild fancy on my part. There are already equations in quantum chromodynamics that no human lives long enough to complete. I think you will also see virtual reality technology so good that it will empty the cities because people will virtually commute riding the network instead of reality. And the virtual reality technology may, more seriously, provide fantasy experiences so powerful that many members of society will never want to come out of the software. Then I think you will begin to see the end of most institutions as we know them today. In particular, education in real places with walls, and in more particular, politics, where the creaking and inadequate 18th century representative democracy we live with today will be replaced by a 24-hour online forum peopled by every citizen's electronic agent. A world in political and economic fragments, driven by constantly shifting allegiances in almost permanent crisis somewhere or another. The end of the nation state and its break up into independent entities like Scotland or Sicily or Florida. Their independence sustained by solar energy and the kind of knowledge manufacturing technologies that will make smaller and smaller industries and communities and corporations economically viable. An explosion of cultural pluralism as communications technology not requiring the ability to be literate or numerate opens the airwaves and fiber pathways to the most remote of communities in the deepest jungles, an event which will force us to accept and celebrate difference rather than attempt to hide it as we do today behind politically correct platitudes. You will see, I believe, also the devolution of power in every institution from the center to every individual on the network who is also prepared to accept the responsibility. So no more managers. And I think you will see genetic engineering to correct social deviance, massive levels of planetary pollution and degradation, the end of jobs for life, the demassification of human behavior, and an upsurge of extremist individualism. And finally, and perhaps most important of all, powerful use by demagogues of the media of all kinds to promote ideological, religious, and political insanity of all kinds. I am therefore suggesting a world where if you stand still, you'll be out of time. If you don't constantly reskill yourselves, you will be out of work. And if you believe in permanent anything, you'll be out of touch. And the only way to prepare for this world of anarchy and transition you will be living in, I think, the only way to enjoy the unparalleled opportunities it will also provide for personal development and individual fulfillment, as well as for fun and games and scads of money, the only way to prepare for the general anarchy will be to do exactly what you have just done, to spend four or more years at the grindstone known as Ball State, learning not to be chemists or art historians or linguists or optometrists, but as the president said, learning to learn, the single most important talent that will see you through the first half of the 21st century. So if I have any message at all that I would want you to remember, and I did warn you I was going to be boring, it is this. Don't ever forget that all of this was just a rehearsal, that learning does not end here. It begins here, 
So don't shut down your brains tomorrow. You will be needing them more than I or your teachers or your parents ever did in the slowpoke world we came from. So I wish you good luck, and I leave you with one last cliched one-liner from the world of showbiz from which I come, and it is this. Be nice to people on the way up. You will need them on the way down. Thank you, Dr. Burke. Ms. Lynn M. Martin, will you please present yourself for the awarding of this degree? Lynn Martin, Secretary of the Department of Labor in the administration of President George Bush, earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois, where she was a member of Phi Beta Kappa. Her public service career began in Illinois as a Winnebago County board member and continued as a state representative and senator. Because she was a most articulate spokesperson for her constituents, they elected her five times to the United States Congress, where she was selected vice chair of the House Republican Conference. Currently, she advises the accounting firm of Deloitte & Touche, sits on several corporate boards, and teaches part-time in the Kellogg Graduate School of Management at Northwestern. Because she is so well-versed in workforce issues, she is sought after as a speaker and has appeared as commentator on Nightline, CNN's Crossfire, and Public Radio's Marketplace. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Ball State University, I hereby confer upon you the, doctor, the degree of Doctor of Laws with all the rights and privileges thereunto pertaining and award you this diploma in testimony thereof and present you the academic hood for this degree. First to the graduates and to the parents, and then to my colleagues, Mr. President, the teachers um, who have helped make this day a group that I have again joined. James, there's one thing you forgot about, the world of the future, and that's something that's going to remain the same. And so rather than talk to the graduates, even briefly, if you can ever expect that from a professor and a politician, I'd like to talk about a relationship that we have with each other. A few years ago, it was a Mother's Day, as tomorrow will be, I was traveling to Illinois with the then President of the United States, an extraordinary, it's an honor to do that, to be in Air Force One, of course, is a thrill. But I was actually going past for another reason. I was going to leave the President, and I was going to visit dear friends in Peoria, Illinois, um, a young, incredibly bright London School of Economics graduate and his wife, who were friends. Uh, from the Illinois General Assembly, and they had just had their second child. Their first child was beautiful, bright, spectacular. Jeffrey was terrific. And on this Mother's Day, I was going to go visit their second child, Jennifer, who was born with Down syndrome. Jennifer was seven months old, and I hadn't seen her yet, and I wanted to be sure that that Press and Diane knew that Jennifer was welcomed and was going to be part of this world. And when I went to visit him, Jennifer, Jennifer was on a, uh, an incredibly bright blanket. And you have to remember, I'm kind of old. We used to put girls in pink and boys in blue. She was on this bright primary colors. And Diane, who was a teacher, said that's because uh, babies, especially babies with learning disabilities, should be stimulated at all times, should be given the brightest colors, should be given the kinds of things that can help them move forward. And I thought, of course, now that she says it, of course. And I asked if they wanted me to babysit so that they could go outside and play with Jeff a while and put up a swing set on this sunny, beautiful Mother's Day back in Illinois. And they thought it would be kind of wonderful because Jennifer required a lot of care. So Jennifer and I were on the porch talking with one another, and Jennifer turned over. Now, I'm telling you, 
For every parent in this audience, when you turned over, it was a big deal, but you did it when you were three or four months old. So I called outside and I said, Jennifer just turned over. And Prescott yelled back, no, 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 you mustn't be watching her. She can't turn over yet. I said, Jennifer, I mean, Jennifer just turned over. And Jennifer, of course, promptly just turned back. And I said, Jennifer just turned over again. And they both came running in with Jeffrey, who was three and didn't know why everyone was so excited. And Prescott Bloom said to me, you don't understand, Lynn. Jennifer can't turn over yet. She's going to be about 18 months, the doctors think, before that happens. And I said, well, someone better tell Jennifer. And I popped her back down, and she promptly turned over again. And we cried, all of us. I accept this honorary degree today in Jennifer's name, and I hope that that's one of the reasons that you have gone to college to make sure that no one can ever tell you what you can or cannot do. And that when someone says that they can't do it because they need a little extra help because of what you've learned here and because of what your parents have told you about love and caring and all those virtues that we don't speak about nearly enough, that you remember to help Jennifer turn over and you don't let anyone ever stop you from that effort. Tomorrow is Mother's Day again. You have given a present to your mothers today that they will treasure forever. They'll remember when you were 13 and truly dreadful. They'll remember when you were 19 and worse. But for this moment, they will remember you and all the Jeffreys and Jennifers and Todds and Tyrones and Tylas and Kristens and Kates and Marys and Johns, and especially you as individuals, because they will have seen you graduate from a great university and know because they helped and because of others helped, you will have a wonderful, incredible life before you where you too can help others. Thank you for letting me be a part of it. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Mr. Kent C. Nelson, will you please present yourself for the awarding of this degree? Mr. President, I'm pleased to present Kent C. Nelson for the degree Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. Graduating in 1959 from Ball State University with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, Kent Oz Nelson immediately went to work for United Parcel Service. Thirty years later, he became the chairman, chief executive officer, having worked his way through various corporate positions. In February of this year, Fortune magazine named UPS one of America's most admired corporations. And for this, Nelson gets much of the credit. He has helped UPS transform itself into a sleek, high-tech operation that actively embraces new technos and leading others selflessly. UPS adheres to these principles by using vehicles and uniforms that are impeccable, by delivering packages as promised, and by promoting employees who successfully manage, motivate, and develop the people around them. Nelson also believes in corporate loyalty, saying that UPS hires with the hope that employees will stay with them until they retire. Named a distinguished alumnus by Ball State in 1991, Nelson has also been recognized for his leadership ability through appointments to several corporate boards, a directorship of the United Way of America, and chairmanships of the boards of the UPS Foundation and of the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the world's largest organization dedicated to helping disadvantaged children. Moreover, he is very active in public school reform movement in the state of Kentucky. During Ball State's 75th anniversary year, it seems highly appropriate to honor this graduate who has not only achieved great success in his chosen field, 
but has given of himself unstintingly in public service. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Ball State University, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws with all the rights and privileges thereunto pertaining and award you this diploma in testimony thereof and present you the academic hood for this degree. What does come with this degree, by the way? Thank you very much, President Wortham, the distinguished trustees, and of course my fellow honorees, and most importantly, the uh, faculty and students and parents who are all here today. I'm uh, very much honored, to, and my wife Peg and I are thrilled to share this day with you. Uh, it's always a pleasure for us to come back to Ball State, particularly when we see the positive change and growth that the school continues to experience. I believe that the ongoing dedication of the faculty to teaching as opposed to the diversionary activities of so many other educational institutions has uh, served our students very well over the years. And the continuing efforts to elevate academic standards demanded of incoming students will also make the university stronger and stronger in the years ahead. When I look back from the day I graduated from Ball State 35 years ago, I'm fortunate to have had so many positive things happen to my life. I address of this weekend, some of you will probably hear how valuable your college education will, will be to you in pursuing your goals, and I couldn't agree more with that. But I believe you will take We're not too far removed from a decade in which a quick buck and a quick rise to the top was almost expected by many of the young people entering the workforce. Some got it, but most didn't. I think the pendulum is now swinging back into a much more favorable and realistic direction. There is a stronger appreciation of the rewards that come from a good education, hard work, determination, and above all, patience. It's a worth ethic we know a lot about at UPS, as does this administration here at Ball State. So you've been well prepared to go out and tackle the real world. Use your skills, work hard, and I'm sure much success will come your way. Our student trustee, Chad Davis, asked me last night if there were any words of advice I could give him to help further his success in the future. And the only thing I could think to tell him was, if you work hard to make the people around you successful, uh, they'll do the same for you. Good luck in the future, and I'm very honored by this award. Mr. President, I am pleased to present John R. Seffrin for the degree Doctor of Science Honoris Causa. A distinguished health educator, John Reese Seffrin is the Executive Vice President and Chief Staff Officer of the American Cancer Society. Throughout his career in public health, he has been active in various national health-related organizations, contributed numerous articles to professional publications, and served on the editorial boards of at least eight journals. Seferin also gets out the message that many cancers can be prevented through healthy lifestyles while others can be cured through early detection and proper treatment. Ball State's Teachers College named him an outstanding alumnus in 1982 because of the leadership role he has assumed in public health education. Today, our university is pleased to award him a second Ball State degree, an honorary Doctor of Science degree. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Ball State University, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws with all the rights and privileges thereunto pertaining and award you this diploma and testimony thereof and present you the academic hood for this degree. President Worthen, distinguished members of the Board of Trustees, fellow graduates, ladies and gentlemen, and especially mothers. This is an extraordinary day for me, a special honor to receive such a high award, an honorary doctorate of science, and to also be coming back home, not only to Indiana, but near Hagerstown, just a few miles down the pike. I don't believe there is such a thing as a self-made 
person. I would like to acknowledge and thank first and foremost my family, my family of orientation and my family of procreation, for without their love and nurturing support, I could never have pursued my professional dreams. Secondly, I'd like to thank all my teachers. There were so many who struggled so hard. There is no nobler profession, I believe, than to teach, and one of the original meanings of the word doctor was to teach. I would like to thank especially Miss Burke, my high school biology teacher, wherever she may be. I, would like I will always be grateful for my lust for lifelong learning, which was sparked and formed right here at Ball State. It has been my good fortune to visit, to teach, to lecture at some of our nation's very finest institutions of higher learning. But I want to say here publicly that some of the very best teaching that I have encountered in my life has been right here at Ball State University. In closing, I would like to share with the new graduates and with my daughter Mary, who's here present, just two lessons which have guided my life. The first, you must love your work for it to be truly fulfilling and for it to help make you a complete person. Your vocation in a very real sense, must become your avocation, too. The great poet Robert Frost captured this idea in a poem he wrote and subtitled, A Full-Time Interest. And that poem ends with these words, But yield who will to their separation. My object in living is to unite my avocation and my vocation as my two eyes make one insight, only where love and need are one, and the work is play, for mortal stakes is the deed ever really done for heaven and the future's sakes. And the second lesson simply is, I implore you, my colleague graduates, to seize the day by accepting the duty you have to make this world a better place or others. It will soon be in your hands, and if you respond, it will truly ennoble your life. The Svengali poet from Calcutta, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, wrote, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was duty. I acted, and behold, duty was joy. Good luck to you in pursuing the joy of your duties. If you succeed, then and only then will you experience the ultimate meaning of the word freedom. Carpe diem, and thank you very much. Dean Wheeler and Dr. Wright, we will now proceed with the hooding of the doctoral candidates. The candidates for the doctoral degrees will now proceed to the platform to cross as their names are called and be... <laughs> Jason Allen Brotherton, a graduate of Muncie Central High School, Muncie, Indiana, earned a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. <laughs> Rachel C. Greenow from Triton Bourbon High School, Bourbon, Indiana, has earned a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish. Congratulations to each of you and best wishes for continuing successes.
Would Dean Johnstone please come forward to continue with the College of Sciences and Humanities ceremony? Our president, Dr. Worthen, will now confer the master's degrees. Will the candidates for all master's degrees please rise? President Worthen, I present to you those candidates for master's degrees in the College of Sciences and Humanities who, on or before this day, have completed all the requirements for their respective master's degrees. 